Born in 1974, Dan Johnson was a longtime designer at Insomniac Games, starting back with the original Spyro the Dragon on the PlayStation 1. As an in-joke with the company, Dan started appearing in Insomniac's games in small cameos, beginning with Spyro Ripto's Rage, appearing on coins in a fountain in the level Mystic Marsh. Dan was beloved amongst the Insomniacs, being especially close friends with Ratchet & Clank creative director Brian Allgaier. The Dan Johnson cameos would continue into the Ratchet series with Dan's face appearing in various areas of the games, like on computer screens, his name written in binary code on signs, and even on a snowman. Eventually, a new company known as High Impact Games would be created for members of Insomniac, Dan included, who would develop portable spin-off titles for the Ratchet series like Ratchet & Clank, Size Matters, and Secret Agent Clank, released in 2007 and 2008 respectively for the Sony PlayStation portable with later ports to the PlayStation 2. The cameos would continue there, as Dan Johnson would now make the jump to being an unlockable skin for Size Matters multiplayer mode. Dan was a vital team member at Insomniac and High Impact. However, his life was not without struggle, having experienced a series of leg surgeries that kept him in the hospital quite frequently. In 2006, Dan made the decision of wanting to share his experiences and create a book to inspire those who have faced similar medical challenges as he had. These hopes were tragically cut short, however, when Dan suddenly passed away that same year. The loss reverberated through both companies and all of Dan's friends he had made along the way. And to memorialize him, a blog was put together for Dan's family and friends to share pictures and memories of him, like his unlockable skin that would appear in the then-upcoming Size Matters. While Dan's passing was sudden, his legacy would live on in all the lives he touched, with Dan Johnson truly becoming a permanent aspect of the Ratchet & Clank franchise, with future games seeing him return as an unlockable skin, appearing as an action figure, to even having his own entry in the Intergalactic Museum of History as featured in Ratchet & Clank Into the Nexus. Once a running gag, Dan would now be memorialized in Insomniac's games to keep the memory alive of such a loved team member who was part of the Insomniac family from the beginning. Here stands the heroic figure of Dan Johnson. Mr. Johnson once lived on a primitive planet called Earth, where he mixed techno music, raised cats, and discovered the often overlooked secret of enjoying life. Go outside, meet friends, and share their company while consuming delicious food and a sparkling beverage. Compared to their late launch in the PlayStation 2, when the successor was revealed, the PlayStation 3, it was hit the ground running with Insomniac. While a team worked to bring Ratchet Deadlock to release in 2005, Insomniac was now a large enough company to work on more than one game at a time, and a separate team worked to bring their very first high-definition title to be ready in time for the PS3's launch in November 2006. Resistance Fall of Man would launch day and date with the North American release of the PlayStation 3, and would be a departure for Insomniac, pivoting to a dark, adult sci-fi first-person shooter. With the much-publicized release of Resistance, fans were left to wonder if, after four games in four years, Insomniac was truly done with their trusty Lombax and Robot companion. That could not have been further from the truth. Ratchet & Clank was coming to the PlayStation 3. That much was true, but Insomniac believed they had to do something different. After four games, the looming threat of franchise fatigue was always there, even with 2006 being the first year since 2002 to not feature a major release in the franchise. I think for most people, most developers, the temptation would be, we're going to do Ratchet & Clank, except it's going to be on the PlayStation 3. We're going to do a PlayStation 2 game, all the features, and now we're going to take it to the PlayStation 3. The first order of business was figuring out what Ratchet & Clank's universe would look like on the brand new console. Not only would the series be entering the high-definition realm for the first time ever, the PS3 allowed for an incredible leap in visual detail, having the capacity to create more complex characters, environments, and objects, while still maintaining the high level of performance that Insomniac held themselves to with their titles. Using their engine for Resistance Fall of Man, Insomniac created a visual diorama of the city of Metropolis, a location that had appeared in a few Ratchet games at that point. The city felt 
huge and alive, with dozens upon dozens of vehicles zipping in and out of the frame as the camera flew through the landscape that stretched way farther in the distance than ever seen on the PS2. Ratchet & Clank's world had always been lively, but never like this, never to this detail. This sequence was shown to audiences at the 2006 Game Developers Conference and was received extremely positively, especially once it reached the internet and that giant blimp with the series logo floated into frame. Ratchet and Clank were back, and it was going to look incredible. One caveat, it all had to be made from scratch. While sharing technology with the Resistance Fall of Man team, who themselves were hard at work on a sequel, the team on Ratchet PS3 had a goal. They wanted to create the experience of playing a CGI movie. That meant recreating the titular heroes from scratch in much higher detail. Ratchet was once made up of 110 bones for his original model on PS2. His PS3 refresh would have 120 bones, and his face alone. Coupled with the better visuals, the goal of playing a CGI film also meant that the storytelling department also had to be stepped up as well. With hired writer TJ Fixman, who had worked at Insomniac in QA and design support previously, the team made a plan to fully elaborate on Ratchet and Clank's world. What was the mythology, the history of these planets and characters? characters. And where the heck were all the Lombaxes? With Resistance Fall of Man under their belt, Insomniac would now be firing on all cylinders to bring to release the most epic Ratchet entry yet. The transition to a new console is never an easy one, and while Ratchet PS3, now officially titled Ratchet & Clank Future, Tools of Destruction, had ambitions to include a wide number of planets, more cutscenes, space combat, and multiplayer features, many of that had to be cut. Instead, Insomniac made the decision to trim the game down and focus on what could be done as the first PlayStation 3 title for the series, refocusing on the story, gameplay, and the goal of a cinematic experience. Since they were in a new engine, that meant the scope for the game had to be smaller. What was there was still exceptionally produced. Insomniac was crafting its most visually breathtaking release ever for the time, and one of the best looking PlayStation 3 titles to boot. The team would focus on creating one completely realized level while in pre-production to establish exactly what they would need to do to create the perfect Ratchet experience experience on the new console. The game would be completed with less content than planned, yes, but what was there greatly outweighed what was left behind. Tools of Destruction would be released in October of 2007, just under a year after the PlayStation 3's launch to stellar reviews and sales, with some review outlets calling it the best in the series thus far. The game was universally praised for its stunning visuals, gameplay, and new focus on deeper storytelling. As it turned out, Tools of Destruction was the first title of what would come to be known as the Ratchet Future Trilogy. As written by TJ Fixman along with Brian Hastings and Adam Moore, Tools of Destruction told a story intended to explore Ratchet and Clank's origins. While hanging out in Metropolis, the city is brought under attack by an army of aliens commanded by the Napoleon-like Emperor Percival Tachyon. Your name's Percival? <laughs> The crown prince of the long-lost race known as the Kragmites. Ratchet and Clank escape his grasp and find themselves on the planet Festoon, the long-abandoned home planet of Ratchet species, the Lombaxes. At the same time, Clank starts receiving visits and visions by adorable creatures known as the Zoni. Finding and restoring an abandoned Lombax ship called Athelion, they learn that the Lombaxes were besieged and had to escape Festoon as Tachyon led an attack that wiped out what was left of their civilization. Seeking out more information, the duo meet Talwin Apogee, a young woman whose father, Max Apogee, was an expert on Lombax technology, and may know the secret to where the Lombaxes ended up after Tachyon's attack. The Kragmites and Lombaxes were at war for a long time, and the brutal conflict ended with a Lombax device known as the Dimensionator being used to banish the Kragmites to another realm. One Kragmite egg was left behind, however, and when it was born, the young creature was taken into care by the Lombaxes on Festoon, raising it as their own. That young Kragmite would grow up to become Tachyon, who upon learning what happened to his people, created an army that wiped out the Lombaxes. Those who survived used the Dimensionator to escape as one state behind to hide the powerful device from Tachyon. The Lombax who stayed was Ratchet's father, who eventually had to sacrifice his life to save his son and keep the Dimensionator from Tachyon's claws. Ratchet, Clank, Talwin, and Talwin's cantankerous robot friends Kronk and Zephyr There's the scoundrel! Pulverize him! Thruster coils. Continue to search for clues on the Lombaxes and eventually find the Dimensionator, only for it to be obtained by Tachyon, who uses it to bring the Kragmites back to their own dimension. A fight ensues between the last Kragmite and Lombax, with the Dimensionator getting damaged, causing a black hole that sucks Tachyon away for good, ruining the device in the process. With the Kragmites defeated, Ratchet and Clank return to the Apogee space station only for the Zoni to make themselves known to everyone, whisking Clank away to somewhere unknown, stating he has a greater purpose to fulfill. The story ends on a cliffhanger with Ratchet standing in disbelief with his best friend vanished. Let him go! It's time to 
understand your purpose. It is time to come with us. Yes, time to come with you. Clank! While the cliffhanger ending was divisive, the story of Tools of Destruction had done its job, unifying the lore of the Ratchet and Clank universe across its mediums and set the stage for future stories to come while making Ratchet more relatable to players as he struggled to come to terms with his past. Tools of Destruction also made for a wonderful jumping off point for the franchise on the PS3. The worlds were bigger with larger enemies to defeat, the weapons delivered visual spectacles not seen on the PS2, and Insomniac was finally able to implement previous weapon and gadget concepts like the Groovatron, a disco ball that made enemies do unique dances that left them open to attack. It quickly became a fan favorite. Another plus of the new platform was the ability to even give the weapons themselves personality. Enter Mr. Zircon, an evolution of the bots that provided shooting support in Deadlocked, was now a trash-talking comedic robot who would still provide support in combat, but would make fun of enemies the entire time and even Ratchet himself speaking in the third person. Leaning into the comedy and spectacle of combat helped define Ratchet and Clank in its evolution onto a new platform. With Tools of Destruction complete and release, it was time to continue the story with a sequel, but this time it would take more than just a year to complete. Because of this, Insomniac had the opportunity to make a smaller scale title to come out in between Tools of Destruction and the next full length Ratchet title. Not only would it be smaller, but it would be a downloadable title. Downloadable content, or DLC, was fairly new for the game industry at the time, so it was a completely new experience for the team at Insomniac. What would the game be? Something more experimental, a completely different game style, maybe a space combat based game inspired by the cut content from Tools of Destruction. Or maybe they should create a smaller story to address that divisive cliffhanger. Eventually that last idea was chosen and the downloadable, smaller second entry in the Future Trilogy was born, the delightfully titled Ratchet & Clank Future Quest for Booty. Since the next big Ratchet game was in pre-production, Quest for Booty was developed by a smaller team primarily using assets created already for the Ratchet series. It also led to the opportunity to expand on the space pirates featured originally in Tools of Destruction. With Clank abducted, new gameplay styles were experimented on with Ratchet's trusty wrench, gaining new abilities like tethering platforms to the ground and puzzle platforming segments. Along with that, Quest for Booty also made advances in the style of storytelling of the Ratchet series, focusing more on dialogue trees akin to adventure and RPG games when conversing with the citizens of the game's primary location. Hulafar Island. Crutchitizers. Well, now, I don't suppose there's much demand for that particular item. To address Tools of Destruction's cliffhanger, the story follows Ratchet and Talwin as they investigate Clank's disappearance at the hands of the Zoni. Their search leads them to the Obsidian Eye, a powerful telescope located on Hulafar Island that could potentially help them find where the little robot has gone. After defending Hulafar from space pirates and the ghastly ghost of Captain Darkwater, Ratchet is able to gaze into the obsidian eye and see Clank suspended in a room full of light while the Zoni float around him. Something seems to be wrong with the robot as the Zoni claimed the Doctor was coming to fix him. The door behind them opens to reveal none other than Dr. Nefarious, now off the asteroid yelling for his butler Lawrence as the eye shuts down after giving Ratchet coordinates that may help him rescue Clank. Quest for Booty sold well and was well received when it arrived digitally on the PlayStation Store in 2008. Though it did suffer a bit lower review scores wise due to negatives like the lack of weapon upgrades along with its shorter length. The gameplay experimentation however was praised along with fans finally being satisfied on where exactly Clank had been spirited away to. The return of fan favorite Dr. Nefarious was exciting as well, seeing him appear in HD for the first time. The development and release of the game went relatively smoothly and was a fun title for Insomniac to put together, even though it brushed against the production of the next major title, with the only controversy arriving unexpectedly when the game featured the head of Pirate Slag singing a bit of the song, I'm a Little Teapot. Only a recitation of the fabled Song of the Dead <gasps> shall open the way. I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Here is me handle, here is me spout. The team assumed the song was in the public domain and used a few verses in Quest for Booty as a small joke, only to learn that the song was absolutely not available for free use, leading to lawyers contacting the game company in what amusingly became known as Teapot Gate. I thought it would be funny if the pirate head just sang I'm a little teapot in order to open one of the doors. It was just one of those dumb, funny jokes that you'd throw in without thinking a lot about it. It turns out someone actually owns the rights to I'm a little teapot, and that person has lawyers. The issue was settled out of court. 
Now, after Quest for Booty was released and with Insomniac officially comfortable with the Ratchet franchise on the PlayStation 3, it was time to go big. Like, biggest PS3 game they've ever made big. Potential finale of the Ratchet & Clank series as a whole big. After so much content was cut from Tools of Destruction, and with the prospects of the conclusion to the future trilogy as a potential grand finale for the series as a whole, everything went into the next game, Ratchet & Clank Future A Crack in Time. For the first time in the series, Insomniac included full space exploration, allowing Ratchet to use a Aphelion to travel from planet to planet in open space, doing side quests, getting into some intergalactic combat, and even exploring small spherical worlds, returning from all the way back in Going Commando. Whereas Tools of Destruction had the aim to feel like you were playing a cinematic CGI film, A Crack in Time took that concept and really fully realized it, telling an engrossing story in parallel as, for the first time, Ratchet and Clank were separated. After learning Clank's sort of whereabouts, Ratchet sets out on a journey to find his friend, naturally with Captain Quark in tow. He happens upon a species of creatures known as the Fongoids, who seem to have a connection with time anomalies that are appearing throughout the galaxy. At the same time, Clank awakens to find himself on the Great Clock, a massive device located at the exact center of the universe. Give or take 50 feet. The Great Clock maintains time in the universe after an incident where the Fongoids were given the power to manipulate time, only to abuse its power causing a tear in the space-time continuum. Now the Great Clock keeps everything in check, holding it all together. Clank's origins are fully revealed as well, as he learns he is the son of Orvis, the original caretaker of the clock, delightfully voiced by Mario himself, Charles Martinet. <laughs> Orvis went missing, however, and the clonk fell into the hands of Dr. Nefarious, leaving Clank and Orvis' assistant, Sigmund, to try to stop Nefarious and clean up his mess. Nefarious intends to use the clock as a time machine, a purpose it isn't built for beyond traveling maybe just a few minutes, to make himself supreme ruler of the universe. Naturally. The game's story plays out in parallel, as Ratchet searches for Clank and Clank works to take back the Great Clock. Eventually, Ratchet meets up with an actual fellow surviving Lombax, an imposing man named Alistair Azmuth. It turns out that Azimuth was best friends with Ratchet's father, now revealed to be named Caden. However, Azimuth was exiled from the Lombaxes when they escaped the Kragmite's wrath, as Azimuth was tricked into trusting Tachyon when he returned to the Lombaxes as an adult touting advanced technology. Tachyon used his sway with Azimuth to form his army to wipe out the species for good. Azimuth attempted to right his wrongs when the attack finally came, and tried to go back to Festoon to save the Lombaxes there, including Ratchet's mother. Unfortunately, he was too late, and she, along with the other Lombaxes hiding, were already killed. As punishment for his his crimes and leading Tachyon to their destruction, Azimuth was left behind while the remaining Lombaxes escaped to another dimension. As Ratchet and Clank eventually reconnect, Clank advises in not using the Great Clock as a time machine, as Azimuth wants to do just that to turn back time and save the Lombaxes from his own mistakes. Ratchet and Clank put a stop to Dr. Nefarious's plans and destroy his nearby station, seemingly destroying the mad robot for good. <laughs> However, Azimuth is still determined to use the clock to turn back time. When Ratchet denies him, Azimuth retaliates and actually kills Ratchet on screen, kills him, and he falls to his death. Out of choices in remembering Orvis's words, Clank uses the Great Clock to turn back time just enough to stop Azimuth from murdering Ratchet. This leads to an epic fight on the Great Clock as Azimuth tries to turn back time, claiming he can kill Ratchet now and save him in the past. After an arduous fight, Ratchet is able to get Azimuth to see the error of his ways. However, the clock is falling apart, and as a last-ditch effort, Azimuth sacrifices his life to stop the clock's and the universe's destruction. In the aftermath, Clank determines that Sigmund is truly right for the role as caretaker of the clock and leaves with Ratchet, ready for more adventure. And remember, the universe has a wonderful sense of humor. The trick is learning how to take a joke. <laughs> It was quite the epic conclusion to this trilogy, and no cliffhanger this time. Nefarious was defeated, the clock restored, and while Ratchet had not found the lost Lombaxes, the answers to his and Clank's pasts were finally answered. All in all, considered a great ending. Critics and players agreed as A Crack in Time was released in 2009 to critical acclaim and again strong sales for the series, bringing in new fun aspects like time travel, visiting planets in the past and present. Unlike entries like Deadlock, A Crack in Time featured everything that worked about Ratchet and Clank as a series, and then some with the return of smaller planets, along with the addition of space 
space exploration, side quests, new open battlefield levels, the addition of the zippy hover boots to allow Ratchet faster movement, and expanded Clank gameplay as he used a time scepter to solve various intricate puzzles in the Great Clock, adding more variety to the series' gameplay formula. All this diversity of gameplay formed a cohesive whole, and a crack in time was the total package. Insomniac threw everything they had into the game, and many considered it one of the best in the series. The future trilogy set out to accomplish a lot. While Ratchet & Clank as a series was already successful, Insomniac's ambition to elevate the series on the new console was, as evidenced by all three titles' reception, a resounding success. Ratchet & Clank firmly and confidently made the jump to high definition, crafting a world that was more intricate than ever, more detailed, more story-driven. Along with that, Insomniac had shifted to more timeless storytelling, hoping for these more modern games to stand the test of time compared to the earlier PS2 titles, which had more specific of the time pop culture references. After now seven games in the main series, Ratchet & Clank had found ways to continue to stay fresh with each entry, solidifying the franchise even more as a force to be reckoned with, with delightful characters, fantastic worlds, over-the-top weapons, and surprisingly emotional storytelling. So that was it. Insomniac put a bow on the Ratchet & Clank series and it was time to move on to other things until it wasn't. While Post A Crack in Time saw the release of a short comic series taking place after the game, the plan was for the story to truly conclude here. However, after the strong reception and sales, Sony wanted more. And, with Insomniac's staff growing larger and larger with each game release, not only was it time for the Ratchet & Clank series to expand, but the company itself would too. Maybe, perhaps, to an entirely new side of the country.